examine the three occurrences of Godhead in the King James Bible. As I said in the last section, we're not asking whether the word is correct or not, but what the meaning of the word is in each use. Now, there are a couple layers to this, so we're going to go into quite a bit of detail, and this is going to be an extended portion. My contention is that Denlinger's definition is necessitated by their need for a term to encapsulate their doctrinal content. They have a theory, and they put that meaning into the word Godhead, and then read it into the verses. If the word had been translated differently, the meaning of the verses would be different. From the last video, you're already familiar with the three verses the word occurs in, Acts 17.29, Romans 1.20, and Colossians 2.9. First, we're going to look at the word Godhead in English by itself. Webster's 1828 Dictionary lists for Godhead. It's noun, Godhead, from God and Saxon Haid, state. First, Godship, deity, divinity, divine nature, or essence, applied to the true God and to heathen deities. Second, a deity in person, a god or goddess. Based on Webster alone, we find that Godhead in English can mean deity, divinity, divine nature, or essence, or a god or goddess. This doesn't mean that any time it's used, it has to cover all those meanings or could validly be any one of them interchangeably, but these are the possible meanings. Now let's peruse some earlier uses of Godhead in English. I've tried to choose these based on being primarily in English originally and prior to or around the same time as the King James Bible. There are a few translated works and later ones that I've used due to clear use of the word or for other poignant matters. By citing these, of course, I'm merely trying to find out how this word was used in the era. First, it occurs twice in Dryden's poem Absalom and Achitophel. And what was harder yet to flesh and blood? their gods disgraced and burnt like common wood. This set the heathen priesthood in a flame, for priests of all religions are the same. Of whatsoever descent their godhead be, stock, stone, or other homely pedigree. And, nor only crowds, but Sanhedrins may be, infected with this public lunacy, and share the madness of rebellious times, to murder monarchs for imagined crimes. If they may give and take whene'er they please, not kings alone, the Godhead's images, but government itself at length must fall to nature's state where all have right to all. Following in The Process of Irish Affairs from Holinshed's Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Whence was the business about the witches at an end when it was signified that a gentleman of the family of the O'Tullys in Leinster, named Adam Duff, possessed by some wicked spirit of error, did die obstinately the incarnation of our Savior, the trinity of persons in the unity of the Godhead, and the resurrection of the flesh. As for the Holy Scripture, he said it was but a fable. The Virgin Mary he affirmed to be a woman of dissolute life, and the apostolic see erroneous. For such assertions he was burned in Hogan Green beside Dublin. Next, the history of Scotland from the same work, under Josinus. With these their sensible instructions, they persuaded many of the Scottish nation unto their opinion, though the greatest part would by no means follow any other kind of religion than that which they had received from their elders. Neither could any of them be brought to think otherwise of the sun, the moon, and stars, but that there was a certain divine power or godhead in every one of them. Next, the history of England, from the time that it was first inhabited until the time that it was last conquered, again from the same. There 1177. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Theodorus, held another synod at Hatfield about the 15 calends of October, in the which all the clergy there present subscribed to certain articles touching the belief of the trinity of persons in unity of the Godhead of the like substance, and also of the same unity and trinity, according to the true faith of the Church of God. Finally from these volumes, the history of England after the conquest. About the same time came certain Dutchmen of the sort called Valdoy over into this realm, to the number of thirty or more, who held opinions and religion contrary to the faith of the Roman Church. For, as one author affirmeth, they which first spread the opinions which these men held came from Gasson and prevailed so greatly in setting forth their doctrine that they mightily increased through the large regions of Spain, France, Italy, and Germany. Simple men, God wot, they were for the most part, as is written of them, and of no quick capacity. 
Howbeit those which at this time came over into England were indifferently well learned, and their principal or ringleader was named Gerard. Now also was a council assembled at Oxford, whereat these dogmatists were examined upon certain points of their profession. The fourth said Gerard, undertaking to answer for them all, protested that they were good Christians and had the doctrine of the apostles in all reverence. Moreover, being examined what they thought of the substance of the Godhead and the merits of Christ, they answered rightly and to the point. But being further examined upon other articles of the religion then received, they swerved from the church, and namely in the use of the divine sacraments, derogating such grace from the same as the church by her authority had then ascribed thereto. To conclude, they would in no wise renounce their opinions, insomuch they were condemned, burned in the forehead with an hot iron, and in the cold season of winter stripped naked from the girl's steed upward, and so whipped out of the town, with proclamation made that no man should be so hardy as to receive them into any house, relieve them with meat, drink, or any other kind of means, whereupon it fell out in fine that they were starved to death through cold and hunger. Howbeit, in this their affliction they seemed to rejoice, and that they suffered for God's cause as they made account. Next, edited by Joseph Ketley, we have the two liturgies, 1549 and 1552, with other documents set forth by authority in the reign of King Edward VI. The Athanasian Creed Whosoever will be saved, before all things it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith, which faith except every one do keep holy and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in trinity and trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Ghost. The Father uncreate, the Son uncreate, and the Holy Ghost uncreate. The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the Holy Ghost incomprehensible. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Ghost eternal. And yet they are not three eternals, but one eternal. As also there be not three incomprehensibles, nor three uncreated, but one uncreated, and one incomprehensible. So likewise the Father is Almighty, the Son Almighty, and the Holy Ghost Almighty. And yet are they not three Almighties, but one Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son God, and the Holy Ghost God. And yet they are not three gods, but one God. So likewise the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Ghost Lord. And yet not three lords, but one Lord. For like as we be compelled by the Christian verity to acknowledge every person by himself to be God and Lord, so we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there be three gods or three lords. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made, nor created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made, nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghosts. And in this Trinity none is afore nor after other, none is greater nor less than other. But the whole three persons be co-eternal together and co-equal, so that in all things, as it is aforesaid, the unity in trinity and the trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He therefore that will be saved must thus think of the trinity. Furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe rightly in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man. God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the world's, and man of the substance of his mother, born in the world. Perfect God and perfect man, of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting, equal to the Father as touching his Godhead, and inferior to the Father touching his manhood. Who, although he be God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ. One not by conversion of the Godhead into flesh, but by taking of the manhood into God. One altogether not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven, he sitteth on the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, at whose coming all men shall rise again with their bodies, 
and shall give account of their own works. And they that have done good shall go into life everlasting, and they that have done evil into everlasting fire. This is the Catholic faith, which except a man believe faithfully, he cannot be saved. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Next, Francis Aydin Gasquet and Edmund Bishop, Edward VI and the Book of Common Prayer, an examination into its origin and early history with an appendix of unpublished documents. Here, discuss a debate on the sacrament in the Parliament of England in 1548 and 9. Cranmer, however, rose and now gave in a few words the creed of his own party. I believe, he said, that Christ is eaten with the heart. The eating with our mouth cannot give us life, for then should a sinner have life. Only good men can eat Christ's body. When the evil man eateth the sacrament, bread and wine, he neither hath Christ's body nor eateth it. The good man hath the word within him and the Godhead by reason of an indissoluble annexation with the manhood. Eating with his mouth giveth nothing to man, nor the body being in the bread. Christ gave to his disciples bread and wine, creatures amongst us, and called it his body, saying, Hoc est corpus meum. Nor which, he says that Christ took not his Godhead from heaven when he descended, nor his body from the earth likewise when he ascended. Cranmer again, In the new this is litera oxidit, when Christ gave his body to take it literally. The bread and wine are not changed outwardly, but inwardly, as we are changed to be new men, yet are we men still. Thou art made God's Son, and Christ dwelleth in thy mind. The change is inward, not in the bread, but in the receiver. To have Christ present really here, when I may receive him in faith, is not available to do me good. Christ is in the world in his divinity, but not in his humanity. The property of his Godhead is everywhere, but his manhood is in one place only. Next, the prayer book of Queen Elizabeth, 1559. It's from the litany to be said on Fridays. We commend also to thy fatherly mercy all those that be in poverty, exile, imprisonment, sickness, or any other kind of adversity, and namely those whom thy hand now hath touched with any contagious and dangerous sickness, which we beseech thee, O Lord, of thy mercy, when thy blessed will is, to remove from us, and in the meantime grant us grace and true repentance, steadfast faith, and constant patience, that whether we live or die, we may always continue thine, and ever praise thy holy name, and be brought to the fruition of thy Godhead. And then from the thanksgiving to God for withdrawing and ceasing the plague, we beseech thee to perfect the work of thy mercy graciously begun in us. And forasmuch as true health is, to be sound and true in that part, which in us is most excellent, and like to thy Godhead, we pray thee thoroughly to cure and heal the wounds and diseases of our souls, grievously wounded and poisoned by the daily assaults and infections of the old serpent Satan, with the deadly plagues of sin and wickedness. Next, the Liturgy of John Knox received by the Church of Scotland in 1564, from the Order of Baptism and Exposition of the Creed. In Jesus Christ we confess two distinct and perfect natures, to wit, the eternal Godhead and the perfect manhood joined together, so that we confess and believe that that eternal word, which was from the beginning, and by the which all things were created, and yet are conserved and kept in their being, did in the time appointed in the counsel of his heavenly Father, receive our nature of a virgin by operation of the Holy Ghost. Next, John Calvin and Henry Beveridge, tracts relating to the Reformation. Since there is no God but one, why do you here mention three, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Because in the one essence of God, it behooves us to look on God the Father as the beginning and origin, and the first cause of all things. Next, the Son, who is his eternal wisdom. And lastly, the Holy Spirit, as his energy diffused indeed over all things, but still perpetually resident in himself. You mean then that there is no absurdity in holding that these three persons are in one Godhead, and God is not therefore divided? Just so. When Paul teaches that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith, he does not substitute an imaginary for true habitation, but reminds us in what way we may ascertain the possession of so great a blessing. We acknowledge then, without any equivocation, that the flesh of Christ gives life, not only because we once obtained salvation by it, but because now, while we are made one with Christ by a sacred union, the same flesh breathes life into us, or to express it more briefly, 
because engrafted into the body of Christ by the secret agency of the Spirit, we have life common with him. For from the hidden fountain of the Godhead, life was miraculously infused into the body of Christ, that it might flow from thence to us. And then from the last admonition of John Calvin to Joachim Westphal, I ask whether he thinks that the essence of God then dwelt between the cherubim in the same manner in which the body of Christ is now supposed to lie hid under the bread. To the same effect, according to him, is the promise, I and my Father will come unto him and make our abode with him. Does he think then that the essence of the Godhead descends to us in the same way as he affirms of the flesh of Christ, that it enters under the consecrated bread to be there devoured? How has he so soon fallen away from what he had quoted from Augustine in the same page, that God is everywhere by the presence of his essence, not everywhere by indwelling grace? Where this holy teacher distinctly opposes the essence of God in regard to the nature of its presence to grace. Should anyone infer from this that his flesh was then in heaven, he will confound everything by arguing absurdly and be brought at last to rob Christ of his human nature and divest him of his office of Redeemer. Nay, if the flesh of Christ is so conjoined to the Godhead that there is no distinction between the immensity of the one and the finite mode of existence of the other, why does Westfall contend that Christ is present by his grace in any other way than by his deity? The question is concerning the divine presence. Augustine answers that the divine nature is everywhere, that the human nature is confined to a certain place. How careless would it have been, supposing the body to fill all things in the same manner as the Godhead, that is, invisibly, to say nothing about it. So far as Augustine from saying that God and man was entire in heaven at the time when he sojourned on earth, that he distinctly affirms that he was then in respect of his flesh nowhere else than on the earth and that it was in respect of oneness of person, it was said, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Hence, too, we infer that whenever he says he will be present, it is by a proper attribute of Godhead. From his clear explanation of sound doctrine, Hesuius makes no more out of the other passage in which he says that our flesh eats the body and blood of Christ in order that it may be fed on God, in other words, be made a partaker of the Godhead. We deny not that the whole and entire Christ in the person of the Mediator fills heaven and earth. I say whole, not holy, totus, non totum, because it were absurd to apply this to his flesh. The hypostatic union of the two natures is not equivalent to a communication of the immensity of the Godhead to the flesh, since the peculiar properties of both natures are perfectly accordant with unity of person. Should anyone ask whether the body of Christ is infinite like the Godhead, he answers that it is not because the body of Christ, his humanity being considered in itself, is not in stones and seeds and plants. What is meant by this clause or exception, but just that the body of Christ naturally, when his humanity is considered by itself, is not infinite, but is so in respect of the hypostatic union. When he says that certain properties are common to the flesh of Christ and to the Godhead, I call for a demonstration which he has not yet attempted. Stephen Charnock, The Existence and Attributes of God, from Discourse 2 on Practical Atheism. First, man naturally disowns the rule God sets him. It is all one to deny his royalty and to deny his being. When we disown his authority, we disown his Godhead. Self is the great Antichrist and anti-God in the world that sets up itself above all that is called God. Self-love is the captain of that black band. It sits in the temple of God and would be adored as God. Self-love begins, but denying the power of godliness, which is the same with denying the ruling power of God, ends the list. It is so far from bending to the righteous will of the Creator that it would have the eternal will of God stoop to the humor and unrighteous will of a creature. And this is the ground of the contention between the flesh and spirit in the heart of a renewed man. Flesh wars for the Godhead of self, and spirit fights for the Godhead of God. The one would settle the throne of the Creator, and the other maintain a law of covetousness, ambition, envy, lust, in the stead of God. As the precepts of God are God's will, so the violation of these precepts is man's will, and thus man usurps a Godhead to himself by giving that honor to his own will which belongs to God, appropriating the right of rule to himself and denying it to his Creator. 
If we are like to God in anything of our natural fabric, it is in the superior and more spiritual part of our souls. The resistance of that which is most like to God, and instead of God in us, is a disowning of the sovereign represented by that officer. He that would be without conscience would be without God, whose vicegerent it is, and make the sensitive part which conscience opposes his lawgiver. Thus a man, out of respect to sinful self, quarrels with his natural self, and cannot comport himself in a friendly behavior to his internal implanted principles. He hates to come under the rebukes of them, as much as Adam hated to come into the presence of God, after he turned traitor against him. The bad entertainment God's deputy hath in us reflects upon that God whose cause it pleads. It is upon no other account that men loathe the upright language of their own reasons in those matters, and wish the eternal silence of their own consciences, but as they maintain the rights of God and would hinder the idol of self from usurping his Godhead and prerogative. Is it an easy thing for man, the competitor with God, to turn his arms against himself, that self should overthrow its own empire, lay aside all its pretensions to and designs for a Godhead, to hew off its own members and subdue its own affections? It is the nature of man to cover his sin, to hide it in his bosom, not to destroy it. And as unwillingly part with his carnal affections, as the legion of devils were with the man that had been long possessed, and when he is forced and fired from one, he will endeavor to espouse some other lust, as those devils desired to possess swine, when they were chased from the possession of that man. Then from his third discourse on God's being a spirit. His works are visible to us, but not his Godhead. We may indeed conceive of Christ as man, who hath in heaven the vestment of our nature, and is Deus figuratus, though we cannot conceive the Godhead under a human shape. Discourse 5 on God's Knowledge God asserts his knowledge of things to come as a manifest evidence of his Godhead. Those that deny, therefore, the argument that proves it, deny the conclusion too, for this will necessarily follow, that if he be God because he knows future things, then he that doth not know future things is not God. And if God knows not future things but only by conjecture, then there is no God, because a certain knowledge, so as infallibly to predict things to come, is an inseparable perfection of the deity. And it is to be observed that God doth not only necessarily remember them, but sometimes binds himself by an oath to do it. Amos 8, 7. The Lord hath sworn by the excellency of Jacob, Surely I will not forget any of their works. Or in the Hebrew, If I ever forget any of their works, that is, let me not be accounted a God forever, if I do forget. Let me lose my Godhead, if I lose my remembrance. It is not less a misery to the wicked than it is a comfort to the godly that their record is in heaven. Discourse 9 on the Wisdom of God But the Ancient of Days is an unchangeable possessor of prudence. His wisdom is a mirror of brightness without a defacing spot. It was possessed by him in the beginning of his ways, before his works of old. Proverbs 8.2 And he can never be disposed of it in the end of his works. It is inseparable from him. The being of his Godhead may as soon cease as the beauty of his mind. With him is wisdom, Job 12, 13. It is inseparable from him, therefore, as durable as his essence. Mysterious is the wisdom of God to unite finite and infinite, almightiness and weakness, immortality and mortality, immutability with a thing subject to change, to have a nature from eternity, and yet a nature subject to the revolutions of time, a nature to make a law, and a nature to be subjected to the law, to be God-blessed forever in the bosom of his father, and an infant exposed to calamities from the womb of his mother. Terms seeming most distant from union, most incapable of conjunction, to shake hands together, to be intimately conjoined. Glory and vileness, fullness and emptiness, heaven and earth, the creature with the creator, he that made all things in one person with a nature that is made, Emmanuel, God, and man in one that which is most spiritual, to partake of that which is carnal flesh and blood, Hebrews 2.14, one with the Father in his Godhead, one with us in his manhood, the Godhead to be in him in the fullest perfection, and the manhood in the greatest purity, the creature one with the Creator, and the Creator one with the creature, 
Thus is the incomprehensible wisdom of God declared in the Word being made flesh. And the ancients generally understood that place, Colossians 2, 3. In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, as an assertion of the Godhead of Christ in regard of the infiniteness of his knowledge, referring wisdom to his knowledge of divine things and knowledge to his understanding of all human things. Discourse 10 on the power of God. This omnipotence is a peculiar right of God, wherein no creature can share with him. To be omnipotent is to be essentially God, and for a creature to be omnipotent is for a creature to be its own creator. It being therefore the same with the essence of the Godhead, it cannot be communicated to the humanity of Christ, as the Lutherans say, without the communication of the essence of the Godhead, for then the humanity of Christ would not be humanity, but deity. There is in this redeeming person a union of two natures. He is God and man in one person, Hebrews 1, 8 and 9. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness, etc. The Son is called God, having a throne forever and ever, and the unction speaks him man. The Godhead cannot be anointed, nor hath any fellows. What more miraculous than for God to become man and man to become God, that a person possessed of all the perfections of the Godhead should inherit all the imperfections of the manhood in one person, sin only excepted, a holiness incapable of sinning to be made sin, God blessed forever, taking the properties of human nature, and human nature admitted to a union with the properties of the Creator, the fullness of the deity and the emptiness of man united together, Colossians 2.9. Not by a shining of the deity upon the humanity, as the light of the sun upon the earth, but by an inhabitation or indwelling of the deity in the humanity. If incomprehensible and infinite power belongs to the nature of God, then Jesus Christ hath a divine nature, because the acts of power proper to God are ascribed to him. This perfection of omnipotence doth unquestionably pertain to the deity, and is an incommunicable property, and the same with the essence of God. He, therefore, to whom this attribute is ascribed, is essentially God. This is challenged by Christ in conjunction with eternity, Revelation 1.8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. This the Lord Christ speaks of himself, who is equal with God, proclaims himself by the essential title of the Godhead, part of which he repeats again, verse 11. And this is the person which walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, the person that was dead and now lives, verses 17 and 18, which cannot possibly be meant of the Father, the first person, who can never come under the denomination of having been dead. No, they should look through the disguise of his flesh to the might of his Godhead. What joy can be wanting to him that finds himself folded in the arms of omnipotence? This perfection is made over to believers in the covenant as well as any other attribute. I am the Lord, your God. Therefore that power, which is as essential to the Godhead as any other perfection of his nature, is, in the rights and extent of it, assured unto you. Goodness is sufficient to make a promise, but power is necessary to perform a promise. Men that are honest cannot often make good their words, because something may intervene that may shorten their ability. But nothing can disable God, without diminishing his Godhead. He hath an infiniteness of power to accomplish his word, as well as an infiniteness of goodness to make and utter his word. From Discourse 11 on the Holiness of God. As it seems to challenge an excellency above all his other perfections, so it is the glory of the rest. As it is the glory of the Godhead, so it is the glory of every perfection in the Godhead. As sincerity is the luster of every grace in a Christian, so is purity the splendor of every attribute in the Godhead. Thou art anointed with the oil of gladness, that thou mightest love righteousness and hate iniquity. But the Holy Ghost, seeming to speak in this chapter not only of the Godhead of Christ, but of his exaltation, the doctrine whereof he had begun in verse 3, and prosecutes in the following verses, I would rather understand, therefore, for this cause or reason hath God anointed thee, not to this end. There must be a reparation made of the honor of God's holiness. By ourselves it could not be without condemnation. By another it could not be without a sufficiency in the person. No creature could do it. 
all the creatures being of a finite nature, could not make a compensation for the disparagements of infinite holiness. He must have despicable and vile thoughts of this excellent perfection, that imagines that a few tears and the glavering fawnings at the death of a creature can be sufficient to repair the wrongs and restore the rights of this attribute. It must, therefore, be such a compensation as might be commensurate to the holiness of the divine nature and the divine law, which could not be wrought by any but him that was possessed of a Godhead to give efficacy and exact congruity to it. The person designed and appointed by God for so great an affair was one in the form of God, one equal with God, Philippians 2.6, who could not be termed by such a title of dignity. If he had not been equal to God in the universal rectitude of the divine nature, and therefore in his holiness. From Discourse 12 on the Goodness of God. It is this the Apostle, in Romans 1, 20 and 21, means by his Godhead, which he links with his eternity and power, as clearly seen in the things that are made, as in a pure glass. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. The Godhead which comprehends the whole nature of God as discoverable to his creatures was not known, yea, it was impossible to be known by the works of creation. There had been nothing then reserved to be manifested in Christ. But his goodness, which is properly meant there by his Godhead, was as clearly visible as his power. The notion of goodness is inseparable from the notion of a God. We cannot own the existence of God, but we must confess also the goodness of his nature. Hence the Apostle gives to his goodness the title of his Godhead, as if goodness and Godhead were convertible terms. As it is indissolubly linked with the being of a deity, so it cannot be severed from the notion of it. We as soon undeify him by denying him good as by denying him great. Optimus Maximus, the best, greatest, was the name whereby the Romans entitled him. His goodness is his glory and Godhead, as much as is delightfully visible to his creatures, and whereby he doth benefit man. I will cause my goodness, or comeliness as Calvin renders it, to pass before thee. What is this but the train of his all lovely perfections springing from his goodness? In bestowing this gift on us, divine goodness gives whole God to us. Whatsoever is great and excellent in the Godhead, the Father gives us by giving us his Son. The Creator gives himself to us in his Son Christ. Under those signs that body is presented, that which was conceived by the Spirit, inhabited by the Godhead, bruised by the Father to be our food, as well as our propitiation, is presented to us on the table. This renders God amiable to himself. His goodness is his Godhead. By his Godhead is meant his goodness. If he loves his Godhead for itself, he loves his goodness for itself. He would not be good if he did not love himself. If there were anything more excellent and had a greater goodness than himself, he would not be good if he did not love that greater goodness above himself. For not only a hatred of goodness is evil, but an indifferent or cold affection to goodness hath a tincture of evil in it. He is a believer's God in covenant, and is a God in the utmost extent of this attribute, as well as of any other, and therefore will not communicate mean and shallow benefits, but according to the grandeur of it, sovereign and divine, such as the gift of a happy immortality. Since he had no obligation upon him to make any promise, but the sweetness of his own nature, the same is as strong upon him to make all the words of his grace good. They cannot be invalid in any one tittle of them, as long as his nature remains the same, and his goodness cannot be diminished without the impairing of his Godhead, since it is inseparable from it. Finally, Gerhardus Voss, Biblical Theology, Old and New Testaments. Regarding the Angel of Jehovah. Of the two views discussed, the one neglects the distinctness between the angel and God, the other neglects the identity between both. The problem is how to do justice to both. There is but one way in which this can be done. We must assume that behind the twofold representation, there lies a real manifoldness in the inner life of the deity. If the angel sent were himself partaker of Godhead, then he could refer to God as his sender, and at the same time speak as God, and in both cases there would be reality behind it. Without this much of what we call the Trinity, the transaction could not but have been unreal and illusory. But it is not legitimate to infer from this that the proximate purpose of such a mode of revelation was to reveal the truth of the Trinity. 
A thing can be based on some reality without which it could not possibly occur, and yet serve to inculcate another fact or truth. Only in a later period, and in an indirect way, were the angel theophanies made to render service for the disclosure of the Trinity. The form in which the angel appeared was a form assumed for a moment, laid aside again as soon as the purpose of its assumption had been served. Usually, but not always, it was a human form. Some have thought that the angel was during the Old Testament dispensation permanently possessed of such an appearance form. This would run contrary to the variableness of the form in which the manifestations took place. It would also anticipate the incarnation, in which the new feature is precisely that the second person of the Godhead assumes a form which remains permanently his own, John 1.14. A still more serious error is the idea that from all eternity this person in the Godhead possessed a material form fit to bring him within reach of the senses. This is inconsistent with the spirituality of God and would have made the angel revelation result in the very misunderstanding which it was intended to preclude. Finally, in regard to the much-mooted question, whether the angel was created or uncreated, a clear distinction between the person and the form of appearance suffices for answer. If, as above suggested, the angel conception points back to an inner distinction within the Godhead, so as to make the angel a prefiguration of the incarnate Christ, then plainly the person appearing in the revelation was uncreated, because God. On the other hand, if by angel we designate the form of manifestation of which this person availed himself, then the angel was created. It is the same in the case of Christ. The divine person in Christ is uncreated, for deity and being created are mutually exclusive. Nevertheless, as to his human nature, Jesus was created. The only difference in this respect between him and the angel is that under the Old Testament the created form was ephemeral, whereas through the incarnation it has become eternal. In this paragraph on Christ is the anti-typical tabernacle. The typical significance of the tabernacle should be sought in close dependence upon its symbolic significance. We must ask, where do these religious principles and realities which the tabernacle served to teach and communicate reappear in the subsequent history of redemption, lifted to their consummate stage? First, we discover them in the glorified Christ. Of this speaks the evangelist in John 1.14. The word become flesh is the one in whom God came to tabernacle among men in order to reveal to them his grace and glory. In John 2:19 through 22, Jesus himself predicts that the Old Testament temple, which his enemies by their attitude towards him are virtually destroying, he will build up again in three days, it est, through the resurrection. This affirms the continuity between the Old Testament sanctuary and his glorified person. In him will be forever perpetuated all that tabernacle and temple stood for. The structure of stone may disappear. The essence proves itself eternal. In Colossians 2.9, Paul teaches that in him the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. With these passages should be compared the saying of Jesus to Nathanael in John 1.51, where he finds in himself the fulfillment of what Jacob had called the house of God, the gate of heaven. In all these cases, the indwelling of God in Christ serves the same ends which the Mosaic tabernacle provisionally served. He is the antitypical tabernacle, is revelatory and sacramental in the highest degree. It's under the Greek term prophetes. The Greek prophetes does not stand in the same direct relation to the deity as the Hebrew Navi does. In reality, he is the interpreter of the oracular, dark utterances of the Pythia, or some other inspired person, whom, from the depth underneath, the Godhead of the shrine inspires. True and truth in the Gospel. Even to God himself can the predicate alethanos be applied in John 17.3. He is the only God having the reality of the essential Godhead in himself. Now, within English Bibles prior to the King James, Tyndale uses Godhead in all three places, Coverdale does as well, but also in 1 Corinthians 2.10. The Geneva has it in all three, plus several occurrences in the notes. The Dewey Rames uses Godhead in Colossians 2.9. 
which is odd that Roman Catholic Trinitarians use this word in their old translation. But it does use divinity in Acts and Romans. Based on this survey of the word from the same era, Denlinger's definition is historically highly unlikely.